Daughter of a Genius by Megan Bell Mashabash Introduction I never thought I would write a book. After all, I wasn't the writer in the family. My sister Mary was the writer, and an incredible speed reader. I was a free spirit, living life to the fullest, carefree, and probably quite selfish. Those who knew me well would say I was always on a mission to find the truth. My husband still tells me to this day, you're a truth seeker, he says, which is the greatest compliment. My entire being has yearned for truth for as long as I can remember. Sometimes I felt like two very different people, the person I thought people wanted me to be and the person I really was. I was never content with surface level interactions and was always looking for more. I would sit for hours with my friends discussing the universe and the wild possibilities of the afterlife, reincarnation and spiritual encounters. Due to many strange supernatural encounters in my life, believing in the spiritual world was easy for me. I thought I had it all figured out. I thought I was wise. More like wise in my own eyes. Eventually, 30 years later, I was led down an unexpected path. A path that I previously would have written off the minute I heard the words Jesus, God, and the Bible. I was so turned off by religion and what I thought were its controlling aspects and limiting ideas that I felt sorry for those who believed in all of it. Without realizing it, I probably thought I was better than they were, more awake and more aware of the truth. Of course, I had never read the Bible. I simply chimed in on the ever resounding arguments of, it's full of contradictions. Ignorance is certainly not bliss but I had to go through a lifetime of internal and emotional pain to truly grasp that. I believe if it wasn't for the power of death, I wouldn't be alive today. That may sound strange, but in the midst of the very dark road that was my life, God found me, or rather, I found him. I don't know why he chose to pull me out of the mud and mire, but he did. I wasn't worthy or deserving, but his infinite love found me and healed my heart and soul in ways I had never dreamed possible. When I first started writing this book more than eight years ago, I thought I knew its purpose and direction, how death can lead to life, my father's death. But God was about to show me how death was really what led to true life. He was about to show me who the real genius was. In this book, I share with you my life's journey. Acknowledging deep depression and dark times of sexual abuse and demonic encounters. So much of my life was hidden away in the darkness that I found comfort in its coldness. For the longest time, I didn't want to be saved. In these pages, I recount the harrowing story of the death of my father, public figure Dr. Fred Bell, in the aftermath of twisted events and how I left my entire life behind to move halfway across the world to honour him and continue his legacy. I met my husband along the way and started a family, a dream I never knew I wanted. I learned about generational curses and how they tried to break us. I learned what love really is and what it's not. This is my testimony, my story, and it is very dear to my heart. My hope in sharing all of this with you is that someone else out there can find freedom and true life and be released from the bondage of their own lives and past mistakes. Shame does not have to trap you. Chains can break. But most importantly, I want people to know a love so profound that it can set them free. A love that can only be found in the one who gave his life for us so that we could live. This is not a book about religion, but rather freedom. Come with me as we journey deep. Some names have been changed in this book, but the story remains true. And the story begins with the day my life changed forever. Chapter 1. Daughter. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a hope and a future. Jeremiah 29 11. September 25th, 2011. I was enjoying the last few hours of my vacation on a beach in Miami with my friend Catherine. Lying down, feeling the grains of sand between my fingers and toes, I was at ease and content. All around me were families relaxing and having fun. The sky was grey with passing clouds, but it was a hot day, so I got up and walked into the ocean to cool down. The weather in Florida is always humid and sticky, regardless of whether the sun is shining, night and day, from the weather I was used to. 
When I returned from my swim, I looked down at my blackberry to see three missed calls from my sister, Mary, in England. My heart was in my throat. For her to call me while I was on vacation could only mean one thing, an emergency back home. But this wasn't just any emergency. I knew why she might be calling. Her son Cameron had been born just a few months before and was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukaemia at only five weeks old. He hadn't left the hospital since and had been referred to an ICU unit in Southampton General Hospital. He required platelet transfusions every few days and had already undergone several blood transfusions just to keep him alive. The doctors had started chemotherapy on Cameron a short while before. Back home, on the days I could get off of work, I would drive to visit my sister in the hospital. She was stronger than most of my family. All on her own, she was there with her sick son. I would find myself having to leave the room because I didn't want her to see how emotional I was. Watching her and Cameron suffer like that, especially on his bad days, was unbearable. To see someone truly suffer and not be able to do anything to help them is an agony I can still feel today. I offered my sister as much support as I could, but like me, she found it hard to accept love. Mary? Are you okay? I anxiously answered the phone. There was a panic in her voice as she responded. Megan! Megan! It's Dad! He's had a heart attack and he's dead! Those were her exact words. This was the moment that, to this day, still plays in slow motion in my mind. My sister wasn't good at delivering bad news. Her way of communicating had always been blunt and to the point. I was silent, blank, and unable to respond, lifeless at the words I had just heard. I found myself telling Mary to shut up, which wasn't the right thing to say and certainly not something I would ever normally do, but in that moment I was in total shock. I wasn't thinking straight. In my eyes, my dad was invincible, like he had a special power that no one else possessed. I'm sure many people feel that way about their parents, but the naive child in me, his child, was completely unable to fathom the idea of him no longer being here. Mary's words hit me like a train. My father. My father Fred was often referred to throughout his life as a genius. He was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan on August 10th, 1943. The Bell family boasted a long line of scientists and inventors, so perhaps it was inevitable that Fred was to join their number. Curiosity and a desire to make life better for people were in his blood. He had a tough upbringing and was beaten by his stepdad when he was five. To my knowledge, his mother didn't intervene. She wasn't loving or affectionate toward my dad either. I believe he badly craved the love of his real father, but sadly never developed a relationship with him. Back in the late 1990s, there were some destructive fires in Laguna Beach where my father lived. One day, he checked his answering machine to find a message from his real father, calling to see if he was okay. It uplifted my dad so much, and he tried to call him back several times, but he was never able to get through. Some years later, his real dad passed away. My father's dad, my grandfather, was Alan Bell, a scientist who had worked with Henry Ford Sr. He was also involved in the famous purchase of London Bridge from England. It's rebuilding in the middle of the Arizona desert and the founding of Havasu City around it. There was also quite a pedigree on my mother's side, with her family tracing its way back to the Revolutionary War hero, Ethan Allen. At the remarkably young age of 14, Fred studied at the University of Michigan in the Randolph Laboratory, where he was mentored by Dr. Donald Katz. He later won 24 national and international awards, including the National Medal of Science. While working for Dr. Katz in the Randolph Laboratory, Fred worked on a magnetic disintegration project later known as the Philadelphia Experiment, a high-temperature fusion experiment, bubble project later known as cold fusion, and shockwave experimentation that led to the classification of high-altitude nuclear blasts, nuclear explosions over water, underground nuclear blasts, and nuclear explosions at ground level. One included the latter part of the Manhattan Project in the late 1950s. In addition, he worked with the University of Michigan's cyclotron during experiments with the bombardment of nuclear particles and their collisions, involving reverse time as observed in the Wilson Cloud Chamber. At age 16, Fred interned at the U.S. Army Biological Weapons Division in Little Rock 
Arkansas. He was paid by the U.S. Air Force but could not wear a uniform until he was 17 because that was the legal age of admission with parental consent. So he was officially unemployed. On his 17th birthday, he was transferred to the U.S. Air Force where he worked on highly classified projects including early warning radar defense systems, SAGE as it's known, radar tracking UFO in Northern California. The Sister Sage site was later known as Montauk in upstate New York, notorious for UFO sightings. Fred was one of the first to bring public awareness of the famed DDS Form 332, which was used by the US military to report to higher command about any identified aircraft activities. He received his master's in physics and went on to work in the private defense sector, independently contracted for companies such as North American Aviation, Autonetic, and Rocketdyne on projects including Star Wars, the military version, laser development, Saturn Rocket's second stage development, the ILAS project, a subdivision of Star Wars where a laser beam is fired to the Earth from satellites, submarine and missile guidance systems, and finally, the lunar landing project known as the Apollo missions. He continued work in the private sector for the next eight years, consulting with companies, government agencies, defence contractors, chemical companies, hospitals, schools, colleges and psychiatric facilities on topics such as computer science, biological science, medical science, environmental testing, quality control, weaponry, aircraft research, advanced propulsion technologies and a variety of other technical issues. Next, he took a break to travel and studied Eastern philosophy, training with Himalayan masters. He became a practicing chiropractor and naturopathic doctor after going back to school and receiving his PhD. He began lecturing with the National Health Federation worldwide, but also continued working as a scientist, studying quantum mechanics, quantum physics, and quantum biology. During his many years working for private companies, the military and the government, my father learned a great deal about many things these organizations were doing that were detrimental to the human body, and he felt driven to address this. So in 1975, he founded his company, Pyridine. From then on, right up until his death in 2011, he strived to invent and share technology and supplementation that would improve people's lives and raise consciousness. His creations, books and music have continued to be distributed through Pyridine and have been enjoyed by tens of thousands of people across the world. His clients have included Queen Elizabeth II, the Dalai Lama, Muhammad Ali, Ray Bradbury, James Brown, Sade, Wesley Snipes, Xenia Seberg and many other public figures. My father was an incredible man, but I will always wonder, did he know God? I can only pray that he did. He has written about Jesus and the Trinity in his books. Being a scientist, I believe he tried to translate spirit in an explainable form. However, there is no translation for the love that is felt by the one and only God through Jesus Christ and how that love spills out into your life in a very real and tangible way. No doubt my father left behind a significant legacy. He also left behind four daughters, me and Mary and our two half-sisters, Alana and Bridget. Childhood. I didn't grow up in a religious household. I don't ever recall hearing about God, but I do remember there was a Bible on my mother's bookshelf amongst many other books on spirituality. The few times we did go to church were when we stayed at my aunt and uncle's house and we had no choice. It was always dark and cold in the church with hard wooden chairs, stained glass windows and an ominous feel. I couldn't relate to it whatsoever. My childhood was different. I was raised by a single mother and a father who lived on the other side of the world. I visited him once, sometimes twice a year. While I wouldn't say I was distant from my father, I wouldn't say I was close to him either. Not in the way that I saw most fathers and daughters. I knew he so badly wanted to be a part of our lives, but it felt like he just never knew how. Not that parenting comes with a book of instructions, but so many things that happened were far from normal, and my sister and I just sort of accepted them and got on with it. My father was very busy, and at an early age, we learned to respect him and do what we were told. That's the way it should be with children, 
and probably why I always hugged him first and showed him love. I instinctively knew he didn't know how to show affection, but I always knew he was a good man. Now that I'm older and have two children of my own, I realize that love was missing from my childhood, from both of my parents in different ways. Growing up without a father figure and lacking the vital dynamic between father and daughter was more impactful than I had been aware of, especially when a father figure would try and step in. I wasn't having any of it, and I rebelled any time my mother had a boyfriend. Of course, later, trying to have a successful marriage, where not only was I never shown real and appropriate love from a man, but also was unsure how to give it back, proved a challenge for me. Through childhood and adolescence, you don't necessarily understand the impact this missing relationship has on your life because you are within it. I separated myself from people and situations very easily, yet always struggled with abandonment in any friendship or relationship I encountered. To me, it was better to have an unhealthy friendship than to be alone. I did what I could to stay within the crowd. In the same way, I was able to cut and run from a relationship at any time. I could be extremely cold. I had some serious character flaws, to say the least. My relationship with men remained distorted as I grew older. Though I knew I had developed a pattern, I wasn't ready to look at why. It was easier to blame the other person than to turn inward and look at myself. This was also demonstrated to me as a child. Some decisions I made were a result of poor judgment, yet others were beyond my control. When I was seven years old, I was touched inappropriately by a taxi driver who used to drive us to and from school. The encounter itself is still hazy in my mind, but I can remember him very well. This led to further strange sexual encounters I had with other kids. I believe this type of behaviour happens often to people as children, perhaps half out of their own curiosity, but mainly because a door has been opened somewhere along the way, even generationally. Despite these experiences, I still trusted men, even when the resounding voice of my mother throughout my childhood telling me to never trust a man. Being a mother now, I see the fragility in children, and it breaks my heart that children experience pain early in life. Having gone through it myself, I could easily sit back and ask why repeatedly. But looking through a worldly lens, it really doesn't make any sense. Now I understand what living in a fallen world really looks like and how much freedom there is in sharing things that are supposed to shame us. There is no shame in Jesus. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Romans 10, 11. Early life. In 1989, my mother Rowena moved back to England from California, where she had been living with my father for about six years. I was two and a half and my sister was four when we returned. My mother was originally from Essex, close to London, and all of her foundations were in England. So when my parents' relationship abruptly ended, she didn't have any choice but to return home. Mum was born with a hole in her heart, and she was a sick baby. My grandmother wasn't close to her. Later in life, I learned from my grandmother that she was afraid to get close to my mother as a baby because of the possibility she may die. As I got older, my mother shared with me how she didn't really receive any love or affection in the same way as her siblings, and she just wanted to get away. So, at 22 years old, she got married. When the marriage didn't work out, my mother left and headed to the United States to stay with friends and work as a babysitter. There, she met my father. Sometimes I wonder how different life would have been if we'd have stayed in America as kids. When we returned to the UK, we lived with my grandparents for a year or so before moving into our first house on Winton Street in Ryde on the Isle of Wight, a large island off the south coast of England. It was a sweet little house with three bedrooms and a kitchen that could only fit two people at a time. We lived there for almost eight years and I carry fond memories of life there. Watching Bambi on repeat, my father surprising us one year for Christmas in the winter of 94. Living with exchange students every summer and hiding my dinner in the back garden so I wouldn't have to eat it. Ride was a cute seaside town with beaches and amusement arcades and lots to do. I have mixed emotions whenever I'm back home visiting and I go to ride, partly because that is where much trauma happened in my life. I remember my sister and I 
we used to walk a lot. At six years old, I had to walk home from school, which took almost an hour. My mum was very busy and I suppose it was normal for kids that age to walk home alone. I don't know. But I did always hope I would walk out of the school gates and see my mum's silver Hyundai Elantra parked there waiting for me, which on very rare occasions used to happen. I worried about my mother a lot and often felt scared that she wasn't going to come home. Some days I used to sit by the back door and just stare through the glass, waiting to see her car pull into the driveway. My mother worked very hard to support my sister and me, and I can't imagine how difficult it was for her to raise two children alone. She saved every penny of what she earned and built from that what she could, never relying on anyone else and never really trusting anyone else. We moved a lot. My mum enjoyed buying homes, renovating them, and then selling them. One home we only lived in for about nine months. She was very good with money and taught me a lot about saving up and not being wasteful. On the outside, I probably seemed like every other normal child, playing outside in the country with my cousins on the weekends, riding horses, drawing and painting. But on the inside, I was a very lost and lonely little girl. When I was 13 years old, we were still living in Ride, just one street back from the seafront where I spent most of my time with my friends. I know now that it was unusual for a kid of that age to have a curfew of 10pm, but that's just the way it was where I grew up. Most of the kids my age, even some of my friends, had started drinking things like cider or beer and smoking cigarettes. It was normal, or at least seemed that way. We would roam around aimlessly, always looking for something to do. One night, my best friend attacked me. She had some anger and aggression issues, and I was aware of that. She had slapped me in the face several times in the past over small things like losing a Nintendo game. But this was bad. I had to be taken by ambulance to the hospital. I was not an aggressive person, and I didn't fight back. I remember waking up in the ER and seeing my mum's face smiling down at me, and I apologised to her for ruining her evening. How silly. But I felt ashamed of what had happened to me. She just smiled and was glad I was okay. After the fight with my friend, I had to wear a neck brace for a while. I remember chunks of my hair falling out and just feeling sad. The whole thing shook me up for some time and so my mum decided it would be a good idea for me to move to America to live with my dad and have a fresh start. I agreed and moved to Laguna Beach, California and attended Thurston Middle School. If I thought school in the UK was difficult, this was way harder. I really didn't like it, and I cried almost every day. I missed my mum so much, and after breaking my father's heart, I left to come back to England. As much as we all wanted it to work out, it was not the right environment for me, or for any child. My dad was accustomed to living a life without children, and I think a lot needed to change in order to accommodate having a 13-year-old living there. I craved connection, encouragement, and love, and I wasn't able to receive it there. I forgave my friend for what she did to me, much to my other friend's judgment, but I held no ill will toward her, regardless of what happened. Life continued, and I started high school. I didn't have the nicest friend group surrounding me and my virginity was taken from me at the age of 14 by an older man. I was pressured and did not consent. This led to other similar experiences happening to me over the next two years. This was a real turning point in my life, for the worse, unfortunately. I really pushed back as a result of all the events that took place between the ages of 14 and 16 years old, and I remember thinking I really couldn't wait to be independent. But it seemed I was always pushing for independence. My mother liked to tell me a story from when I was three years old, and she was driving to my grandparents' house with me and my sisters kneeling on the back seat of the car, looking out the back window and waving to a police officer. My mum drove a little three-door black GM Metro that had a bench back seat and we had our seatbelt strapped over our legs. Mum kept telling us to turn around and sit down but we wouldn't listen. So the red and blue lights lit up and the police officer pulled us over. She told the police officer I wouldn't listen and would just say, 
it's my life and I'm going to live it how I want to. I was three. I can vaguely remember this experience in my mind, but why was I rebelling at such a young age? Today I understand the reason why and just how important the mother-father family dynamic is and how disruptive it can be to fragile little children, but more on that later. My high school years were the tipping point for me. I was friends with the bullies of the school, the in crowd, who liked to prey on the most vulnerable. Most days I ate my lunch in the toilets, because either it was my turn to be outcasted, or I wouldn't do what was commanded of me. I also didn't want to stand around alone on break times, because I would be picked on or called a loner. I was friendly with everyone, and this created problems within my circle because they didn't seem to like that I was nice to outsiders. Being bullied by my own friends fed even more fear inside of me. I began to feel very disconnected at this point. I felt like I had no guidance and no direction. My mum also had no idea of the things that I had been going through, and I was too ashamed to share them. My sister Mary and I were close, but we didn't have the kind of relationship where we could talk about this. She had her own friends and her own life. Her relationship with our mother had always been a struggle, and Mary decided to move out when she was 16. I never really processed how I felt about this, but one thing I did know, it was empty in the house without her.